Welcome to the Douglasville Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School class. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads for prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we come now to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your mercies towards us this past week. We're grateful that we are able to be here in your house this morning, and you have promised that when we gather together to worship you, you promised that you would be here with us and that you'd send your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for doing so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> okay. This week's lesson is called to love the Lord your God. <clears throat> and the memory verse says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. <clears throat> okay, in the Jewish religion, one of the most important prayers is taken from Deuteronomy 6. It is known as the Shema, based on the first Hebrew word of the prayer, from the root word, Shema, which means to listen or to obey, a word that appears again and again, not just in Deuteronomy, but all through the Old Testament. <clears throat> and I'm going to skip over some of that, but it says, the Lord our God, Lord, the Lord is one. Many times when Jews pray, they cover their eyes, the idea being to let nothing distract them from thinking about God. This first line in the Shema is deemed an affirmation of the monotheistic <clears throat> nature of the Adonai Elohuna, the Lord our God, and Israel's loyalty to him alone and to no other God. In fact, it also could be read as the Lord is our God. This one line is part of the first speech that <clears throat> Moses gave to the children of Israel as they were about to enter the promised land. What follows that opening line, however, is a powerful expression of truth that remains as crucial now as it was then. <clears throat> okay, this lesson, actually I enjoyed it very much because further in the lesson it, it starts to bring a parallel between obedience and love, and it kind of... Um, tries to discuss the difference between those things, you know, to love God or just to obey him or uh, talks about legalism <clears throat> and things like that. So I very much enjoyed the lesson and I welcome your comments about <clears throat> some of that as we get to it. Uh, okay, I wanted to read uh, a few of the uh, quotes from Spirit of Prophecy for Sabbath said, man, man gains everything by obeying the covenant-keeping God. God's attributes are imparted to man, enabling him to exercise mercy and compassion. God's covenant assures us of his unchangeable character. Why then are those who claim to believe in God changeable, fickle, and untrustworthy? Why do they not do service heartily as under the obligation to please and glorify God? It is not enough for us to have a general idea of God's requirements. We must know for ourselves what his requirements and our obligations are. The term of God's covenant are, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. These are the conditions of life. This do, Christ says, <clears throat> and thou shalt live. Now, I want to ask a question about that. It says up there, you know, talking about being uh, fickle and changeable and untrustworthy. What causes that? What is the problem with us other than, obviously, we're sinners? <laughs> well, I think a lot of times we would, uh, I think we have a tendency to, to uh, it is our natural tendency, it seems, yes. to uh, go our own way. Okay. okay, and our ways, our ways are not His ways. Yes, and so we that that is something I think that we all all fight against. Yes, uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, is to is to put God first in everything. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I I think 
an example of this was Judas. I mean, Peter to an extent. But what, what was Judas's real problem? He was with Jesus, but he didn't know Jesus. He didn't understand the mission of Jesus. He had his own notion of what it was supposed to be. And he thought he was aiding and abetting and making sure that was going to happen. And in, in doing that, he completely walked away from God and God's true purpose. Um, we love God because he first loved us, right? No other reason. Right? I, I can see no other reason in Scripture why we should love God. If he didn't love us first, how would we even know what love was? Anyone else? Well, why do people love Satan? Because he gives them things. Yeah. I mean, there, there's other reasons to love people, but is it the true, the right way? And is it is it true? I don't think that's love, though. <laughs> well, that isn't. But love is subjective. So yes, and we are told that by love is love awakened. Yeah. And so, so you can't command love, um, but you can win homage to yourself through gifts or, or whatever, and you can win somebody's favor and their support. And so, just like what you said, it is subjective. Um, <clears throat> but but that's not by definition of love, really. That's love. That, that's it, it, It's a form of lust, in a way. That's a human element of it. <laughs> yeah. Right, but when you're talking about love, you have to remember that that not everybody understands the word love. We've been, it's, it's been so distorted by by Hollywood and by everything else. Yes. So when you're talking to somebody that you've just come against, uh, come up to, and you're talking about the love of God, their perception is so distorted that they have no concept of what you're talking about. And so the only way you can reach them is by their human means and by their perception of love. I mean, you can't go talk about love of God without feeding them first or administering to their needs and that's what 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 Christ told us to do yeah. so you can't just talk to them about the love of Christ you've got to you've got to meet them at their perception of what love is otherwise you'll never meet them you'll never reach them I think that's true Connie and when you think about this that, that is exactly what God did but he, he he showed us his love first right that's what I was going to say that yeah. that's because our perception is so messed up that he had to come demonstrate it in a way that is really unspeakable and um, we all we all see that at different depths somebody that doesn't know him is going to see it more superficially but as you as you get know him more and more I think the depth of what he did becomes in a way, more understood, but then in another way, more incomprehensible. Yes, I can understand what you're saying. The love of Christ is a golden chain that binds finite human beings who believe in Jesus Christ to the infinite God. Selfishness and pride hinder the pure love that unites us in spirit with Jesus Christ. If this love is truly cultivated, finite will blend with finite, and all will center in, in the infinite. Humanity will unite with humanity, and all will be bound up with the heart of infinite love. Sanctified love for one another is sacred. In this great work, Christian love for one another, far higher, more constant, more courteous, more unselfish than has been seen, preserves Christian tenderness, Christian benevolence, politeness, and enfolds the human brotherhood in the embrace of God, acknowledging the dignity with which God has invested the rights of man. Yeah, there, there is, and, and I think that <clears throat> sometimes 
you know, and having conversations with people, and I think we, we all do this sometimes. You know, we can read something and say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means just what it says. But really, it's a lot deeper than sometimes what it appears to be on the surface because, you know, sometimes we say or do things with little contemplation about what something is really saying and what the deep meaning is of how, if it was practiced, what a change of character, what a change of um, <coughs> attitude and our love and our comprehension of things and what a deeper experience we would have in spiritual things and in a knowledge of God. But, you know, up there it talks about selfishness. You know, it hinders that. And that's how sin, you know, entered the world is from selfishness, self-seeking. That's what caused it. And that's back to what we talked about, love and everything else. You know, true love seeks not its own. And so <clears throat> a person, well, just like all the disciples, they all join themselves with Christ through self-seeking. You know, really what's in it for me? That was the primary concern of what they wanted to join themselves with him. But 11 of them eventually gave that up, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Judas, Judas never did. Yeah. Okay, so, all right, one last comment here. Well, you know, though, Adam and Eve inherently do not have selfishness. That's right. Satan planted that seed through the voice of the serpent. Yes. Uh, that's, um, but now, of course, we're inherently selfish. That's right. Because of the environment, because of his influence on everything. We are influenced from before the time we're born, actually. Yes. By, by his uh, seed of selfishness. And, and I, think, I think, too, Rob, I think Satan, uh, Satan knew from, uh, probably from his observation of things, of, of the creation, you know, and, or at least the parts of it, and, and also God's interaction with Adam and Eve in the garden, okay? He, he was there. Yes, and so he he pop, There was some. There's something about being inquisitive. Okay, we. Uh, it seems like we're naturally wanting to know more about things. I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's uh, that's the way I am. I like you know. Well, God God gave us the mind to learn. Yeah, right. He, he didn't implant it all in Adam and Eve. He. Right. You don't just you're he, not just born and then you stay there. Right. You know you learn, and. Uh, and so I think that there, there, that he took, that Satan also took advantage of that, you know, you know, knowing, knowing that we're naturally inquisitive. Sure, he did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'll read one last statement for Sabbath's lesson. It says, "Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine." principle, a permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate it or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found. We love him because he first loved us. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's go to Sunday, and it is called to love God. I like what the author wrote up here, so I'm just going to read it. It says, in Moses recounted to the children of Israel their history. He began giving them instructions on what they were to do in order to take the land and to thrive on it. Indeed, one could argue that the bulk of Deuteronomy was simply that the Lord telling the people what they needed to do in order to keep up their end of the covenant, which he graciously made with them in fulfilling his promise to their fathers. Deuteronomy 6 begins like this. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you and your sons and your grandsons all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. <clears throat> but, you know... The main purpose in doing all these things that they lost sight of 
was to be the light on the hill for the entire world. Yes. It wasn't for their own salvation. He'd already given it to them. It was to draw others. And Ellen White talks about somewhere else. That was, th that was their main failing, sure. that they did not minister to others. What about us? No different. No different. That's exactly right. All of his followers have that same charge, don't they, Rob? All of them. Well, see, the blessings that he had given to people like Job and Abraham and others, <clears throat> he wanted to give that to everyone that was his people because he wanted them to be um, up here above the world and to see not just from a spiritual standpoint and salvation, but that to know God, to love him, and to serve him is the best thing you could possibly ever do, not only from a spiritual standpoint, but even a temporal standpoint. But we were told later on in the history of Israel, after they continued to sin and rebel and backslide, it said that God's purposes could only be fulfilled through them through continual humiliation. Being in bondage to other, you know, nations and all that stuff, he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I can't help you if you can't help yourself. That's right. I can't. <laughs> so anyway, okay. <clears throat> it lists there um, in the middle of the page, Deuteronomy, read Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. <clears throat> it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And it says, what command does the Lord give to the children of Israel in verse 5? And it says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And what does that mean? And so we're going to get into that, and I'm welcoming comments right now. The parallel between <clears throat> just merely obeying God as in doing what we're here. You know, it's the Sabbath. We're here in the church. And. Uh, I'm sure that we've paid our tithe and right and <coughs> things such as that versus what it says it's there to love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know, I think it's easy to muddy those two things, you know, because I think it's, it's easy to be content, as the Bible refers to, having a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof. Yes. So what but is... Well, what this is really saying... This, but what does God really want from us? Well, he, he's saying basically your love cannot be divided. Yeah. He says right. that somewhere else you cannot love Gotta God have. and mammon. No. Isn't that what he's saying? Yeah. You cannot divide your love. You can't have a half love for me. You can't even have a 90% love for me. If it's divided by one bit with the world... Well, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, you're lacking. Yeah, and, and back to Judas, you know. I, I imagine he, he really did love Jesus yeah. in his own way, but only 90% or, or, or whatever. Well, that, that's, that's the part of him that made him throw the money back, give it back, and go out and yeah, kill himself. I sin, right, yeah, he knew it. But I, as I thought, you know, when you ask that question, John, when you think about it, and, and uh, this is, um, this is, I think, the question for us today. Do you, all of us here believe that we're living in the end of time, okay? And, uh, and God wants people who are all in. Something and I, just, and I, some... I don't think anything else, honestly, right now, especially in these last days, will pass. I mean, I... See, here's the, here's the difference between Peter and Judas. It just came to me. They both sinned, right? Yeah. They both denied yeah. Yeah. Jesus, right? Yes. The difference is Peter knew Jesus was forgiving. Yeah. He saw it in his eyes, right? Yeah. Judas did not know Jesus well enough to see the grace and forgiveness in him. Yeah. And so he gave up. Yeah. And so then... The, the he didn't question, see the love from Jesus. Yeah, the question that follows, do we? Do we know him? Do we really know him? Yes, Timothy. Eat my body as bread and drink my blood as, as wine. And Judas was like, oh, he's talking about the spiritual world. So he kept him at arm's length. Uh -huh. And so he's the reason he didn't know God. Uh -huh. 
Right, but what I'm saying is Peter had a similar experience, but, but it gets back to the idea. Out to God. Yeah, but Peter the difference is is, is with God and Peter was all in. Even though he fell, he was still he was wanting to be close to God. Right, he had the Judas desire. Was saying, "Oh, you don't really have what I want. I'm distancing myself from you yeah. in case." But Jesus saw that it there was the spark in Judas's heart because he tried to reach him even at the last second. Um, but that spark went out, didn't it not? But it was by his choice. Yes, it was. <clears throat> okay. All right. In the middle of Sunday, it says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. How interesting that here in the midst of the law, in the midst of the warnings, rules, and provisions, that people are called to love God. And not just to love him, but to do so with all of your heart, your soul, and with all of your strength which points to the absolute nature of this love. Loving God with all the heart, soul, and strength means that our love for him should be supreme over our love for everything and everyone else because he is the foundation and crown of all of our being, existence, and everything else. Love for him should put our love for everything else in proper perspective. Okay, and at the bottom of the page it says, what does it mean? To you, to love God with all of your heart, soul, and might. That's what we've been talking about. That. Does anybody else want to elaborate on that? I answered that by saying I, we, I just simply need to put God first in everything. Everything. <clears throat> you know, put him, put him first. And, uh, I mean, I, I don't, how else? I don't know how else you could prove your love for someone. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of Judas, and she talks about that. You know, he, he did this because he believed in the earthly kingdom, and he believed this would prompt Jesus to take the throne. In these last days, there'll be a lot of people that will think they're doing the right thing for God. And they will think they need to do this for God. Basically, Satan's temptation that he tempted Judas with is effective. He will change the question. He will change the perspective, uh, the, the object. But the idea that we, in a way, know what it's supposed to be done, and God needs us to intervene, will be popular. Will it not? Yeah. Um, instead of trusting and loving God, we will think we are trusting and loving God, but in reality, there will be many that um, persecute. Yeah. And that's what Judas ended up doing. He persecuted Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus said, if they've done it to me, they'll do it to you also. I'd like to say that when we love someone, that uh, we wouldn't want to hurt them or disappoint uh, and you know we want to love them and respect them so and that's why you know in a relationship you know you want to do those things and so that's I think a way of uh, treating Christ you know we don't want to do things to hurt him so. but when it comes down to the very last days when you have to make that choice that's going to be a hard choice between family and God yeah, that's a scary thought. Uh, it is. Could be time. Probably will be. But, okay. but like with relationships, so all relationships are based on time and trust, right? You have to give time to whoever you're in a relationship with, and there has to be mutual trust for you to have a relationship. And I'll just tell you, when Jane and I started growing our fondness for each other, I, m I made intentional time. I kept making additional intentional time, right? And so that's how we know we're in a love relationship with God if we're making additional intentional time. Well, I, I Connie has a point, and I, I don't disagree, but I think that um, in a way it may be harder when times are easy and when times are good. It's kind of like it's easier for a rich man to pass through the eye of a needle than to make the kingdom because 
when you feel no need of things, you tend to let your guard down. Things, your heart tends to get caught up in the ease of life. You tend to more easily forget the important things. Um, and it's not big things that are the problem. The big things are a problem when times are tough. It's those little things. Well, that makes time. Right, yeah. and, and I think in the intent of making that time, like you're saying, you become more forgetful of that when, time, when, when things seem easy, good, and smooth. You make time for what's tangible. Yeah, yeah. The one all-important matter is to serve the Lord with full purpose of heart and seek to become the Lord's heart and mind. All who come to the Savior for counsel will receive the very help they need if they will come in humility and with assurance cling to that promise. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And it says, lift up the standard beginning with full surrender and continuing in simplicity of obedience to the Lord's commandments. I have one last uh, little reading here. It says, the atmosphere of the church is so frigid, its spirit is such as of order that men and women cannot sustain or endure the example of primitive and heaven-born piety. The warmth of their first love is frozen up, and unless they are watered over by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, their candlestick will be removed out of its place, except they repent and do their first works. The first works of the church were seen when the believers sought out friends, relatives, and acquaintances, and with hearts overflowing with love, told the story of what Jesus was to them and what they were to Jesus. Okay, let's go to Monday. <clears throat> okay, the middle of the page there, it says, In one verse they are told to fear God, in another to love Him. And in this verse they are told to both fear and love Him at the same time. In the common understanding of the word fear, this might seem like a contradiction, but it's not. Instead, the fear of God and the sense of awe and respect for who he is, his authority and power and justice and righteousness, especially in contrast to our sinfulness, weakness, and complete dependence on him, should be a natural reaction. We are fallen beings, beings who have violated God's law and who, but for his grace, deserve condemnation and eternal death. Okay, so does anybody want to make a comment about that? You know, where it parallels one says to love God, the other says to fear him, and then the other scripture says it both in the same one. Can you divide the two? Are they the same thing, and what is the difference in them? Well, let me, let me, a uh, uh, minor little thing, but similar. You're in a freezing environment. You get a fire going. That, that fire saves your life. You're not going to stick your hand in it, are you? No. You know? There is, there is fear of being burned if you put your hand in the fire. But that fire keeps you warm and sustains your life if you respect and fear it properly. Anyone else? Yeah, well, that's good. <clears throat> I think, first of all, we do have to have, like the author says, we need to have an understanding of what this fear is all about. Okay. It's not being afraid of him. Okay, this is respecting, treating him with awe. Um, having respect for his his power, his strength, and his love. Okay. And and once that happens, and I'm talking to Penny about this this morning on our way to church, I said, you know, I, re I remember back when I was a kid, um, had a Lutheran background, but uh, it didn't it didn't really teach me anything about God's love. Uh, I mean, I knew the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. But, I, but there was no, no real understanding there until I became an adult and uh, was converted, convicted. And uh, boy, what a difference, what a change it made in my life. I'd, 
I didn't know God. Um, actually, I didn't even care about God. Okay? I mean, if, and if you don't know somebody, you don't care about them necessarily, which is a little scary because we're supposed to care for everybody, right? But what, once, <clears throat> I think once we gain an understanding of that, once God gives us the understanding of what his love is all about, what his character is, that's when we, he also gives the power in us, the strength in us to, to do so to others too. You know, to give that to other people, and um, and sometimes so, sometimes the love has to be tough, and it's not it's not always uh, it's not always very pleasant. Uh, we know that all of us, I think, most of us, have run into that. Okay, at the bottom of the page, <coughs> we are familiar. I'm pretty sure with what Revelation says, but it says. How are we to understand why the command to fear God should be the first command of the Lord's last day message to the world? Given what we know about what is coming on the world, why does that command make so much sense? You know, and of course we know what it says, fear God and give glory to Him. Look down. <clears throat> Proverbs 9 and 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One understanding so it makes sense for that to be the first thing that we're to pay attention to it's kind of the foundational principle of our relationship with God and then I love this author's definition it says those who fear the Lord have a continual awareness of him a deep reverence for him and a sincere commitment to obey him wow yeah that's good amen Who's, who is that author scottquestions.org <laughs> okay for you. <laughs> Humility and reverence should characterize the deportment of all who come into the presence of God. In the name of Jesus, we may come before him with confidence, but we must not approach him with the boldness of presumption as though he were on a level with ourselves. There are those who address the great and all-powerful and holy God who dwelleth in light unapproachable, as they would address an equal or even an inferior. There are those who conduct themselves in his house as they would not presume to do in the audience chamber of an earthly ruler. Wow. They should remember that they are in his sight, whom seraphim adore, before whom angels veil their faces. God is greatly to be reverenced. All who truly realize his presence will bow in humility before him. And like Jacob, beholding the vision of God, they will cry out, This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Yeah, Which I think... An important part of repentance, I think, is that is that fear. And it's not like the fear of, oh, he's out to get you. But it, it's the fear that I have fallen way short. I am unworthy, just like Moses, take off your sandals. I am unworthy to be in his presence. But then his love comes in. And what Jesus did on the cross makes us worthy but we cannot forget our place on how undeserving we are of that and I think that's that fear piece of it you have to have repentance before before any of this um, or you'll go right back to it so Judas didn't have a right relationship right when he went into the garden he kissed Christ as if he was an equal you know what I mean? Like yeah. he didn't have a right reverence for God mm -hmm. um, and Christ being God's representative on earth. And that's a big difference between Peter and Judas. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, it says the heart that has once tasted the love of Christ cries out continually for a deeper draft. And as you impart, you will receive in richer and more abundant measure. 
Every revelation of God to the soul increases the capacity to know and to love. The continual cry of the heart is more of thee. And the Spirit's answer is much more. For our God delights to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to Tuesday now. It's called He First Loved Us. Even amid rules and regulations in Deuteronomy and all the admonition warnings the Jewish nation that the people must obey his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, they were first and foremost to love God with all of their heart, soul, and might. Of course, they had good reason to do just that. Okay. I want to read Deuteronomy 7. Seven, eight, and thirteen <clears throat> says the Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the land of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, thine oil, thine increase of the kind, and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. And so this was the evidence that was <coughs> given to them you know, that God made a promise to their ancestors, and he was going to keep it with them. Okay, it says, <clears throat> Again and again in Deuteronomy, Moses told the people about God's love for their fathers and for them. But more than just in words, the Lord revealed this love by his actions. That is, even despite their shortcomings, their failures, their sins, God's love for them remained steadfast. A love that was powerfully manifested in his dealings with them. And then, of course, it says there, it says we love him because he first loved us. Okay, at the bottom of the page, it says how fortunate we are that God is indeed a God of love. A love so great that he went to the cross for us. A self-sacrificing love in which he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Thus we today have a revelation of God's love for us that the children of Israel probably couldn't even have imagined. And of course it says here at the bottom, instead of being love, what if God, were, if God was hate or if God were indifferent? What kind of world would this be? And what is the revelation of God's love for us something that we indeed should rejoice about? You know, John, um, God told Adam and Eve that they would die yes. if they sinned. If he had not have intervened, they would have. And let, let me give, we have examples, I think, on how. Cain and Abel. When God basically, when Cain basically rejected God and it put him out of his heart, he became the first murderer. Judas. Look what happened when the regret and, and, uh, and God left his heart. He killed himself. If God did not, so when God did appear, what's the first thing Adam and Eve did? They started blaming each other in the serpent. If God had not intervened, Adam and Eve, Adam probably would have killed Eve and then killed himself. How would, why, why would that not have been the scenario if God had, if they had rejected God and, and, and He'd been out of their lives. He intervened to stop that. I think that's going to be the same thing in, in the end with the lake of fire. We believe though that the people will initially start to rush the city, right? I heard a sermon the other day that I think makes a lot of sense, but then they turn on each other. God's out of their hearts completely. 
just like these battles with Gideon and stuff. The people turn on each other and it's, it is a mass of death and destruction. God intervenes and stops it. But he can't stop it with salvation this time. He's got to stop it with destruction, right? But this, in his love, he has to intervene. He cannot allow suffering. And he made a plan at the beginning. And he came down and, and, and told Adam and Eve that plan, the enmity, the, the, the heel and the head. We've got a plan. We can fix this. You don't, despair does not have to enter your hearts. You can have hope. Yeah, it's true. When you, when you spoke about that, Rob, you, when you think about it, <clears throat> God's love, true love, doesn't allow for suffering, does it? No pain, no anguish, no suffering. doesn't allow for that in the end. Okay. It allowed for it for salvation, but in the end, not. I mean, we don't even think of that idea that Adam and Eve would have, the Adam, they would have, one would have killed the other than themselves, but it's not that where it would have gone if God hadn't intervened. I never thought of it, Rob, but I, I wouldn't doubt that. <laughs> I mean, the, the wages of sin is death. Yeah, the way things were headed, yeah. Cain and Abel, Judas, that's examples of what would have happened if God had not intervened. Why wouldn't have that happened? We don't really contemplate that they would have done that, but Without God, that's exactly where it all leads. God does not ask if we are worthy of his love, but he pours upon us the riches of his love to make us worthy. He is not vindictive. He seeks not to punish, but to redeem. Even the severity which he manifests through his providences is manifested for the salvation of the wayward. He yearns with intense desire to relieve the woes of men and to apply his balsam to their wounds. It is true that God will by no means clear the guilty, but he would take away the guilt. The merciful are partakers of the divine nature, and in them the compassionate love of God finds expression. All whose hearts are in sympathy with the heart of infinite love will seek to reclaim and not to condemn. <clears throat> okay, the loveliness of the character of Christ will be seen in his followers. It was his delight to do the will of God. Love to God, zeal for his glory was the controlling power in our Savior's life. Love beautified and ennobled all of his actions. Love is of God. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. It is found only in the heart where Jesus reigns. We love God because he first loved us. In the heart renewed by divine grace, love is the principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, subdues enmity, and ennobles the affections. This love cherished in the soul sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around. That's pretty far. Yes, it is. <clears throat> okay. Wednesday's lesson is, is if you love me, keep my commandments. Israel, the nation as a whole, was called to love God, but this was something they on, that it could only happen individually. As a single human being, given free will, each Israelite had to make the choice to love God, and they were to show that love through obedience. It says, what do the following text have in common? That is, what is the common theme among them? Would a couple of you help me read some of those? Maybe one of you, Dick, maybe read Deuteronomy 5.10. And Rob, could you read Deuteronomy 7.9? And would you like to read one, Connie? Be Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. Okay. And I'll read the last two. And Deuteronomy 5, 10. Mm -hmm. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Amen. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, 
who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, with which I command you today for your good. Thank you. Okay, Deuteronomy 11.1 1 says, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments, and his commandments always. And 19.9 says, If thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, to walk even in his ways, then shalt thou add these cities more to thee beside those three. <clears throat> it says, Though obedience it, in, to any of the commandments can be legalism, that kind of obedience isn't really done out of love for God. When we truly love God, especially because of what he has done for us through Christ Jesus, we want to obey him because that's what he asks us to do. It says, what is your own experience in seeking to obey God? That is, what are your own motives in obeying God? Why should it be done out of love for him? What rule, if any, should fear, or what role should any of fear Biblical understanding of fear play as well. So there to ask the question, the difference between legalism and uh, obedience motivated by love. How is that manifested? Well, I, I think of the idea that um, you're serving one of two masters. And Jesus rescued us, redeemed us, bought us, however you want to say it, from the bondage of Satan. You are in bondage of Satan or God. Now, God gives you freedom. Satan does not. So, yeah. and, and so if he frees you through the cross and forgives you, and in response, you love him, if you want to go back to your old ways, you're going back to Satan. You're, you're going back to an old master. You're choosing to reject God and go back to... You know, that, that, that's how I see it, is the love. How can you love him and want to go back to an old master? I don't, I don't think you can, Rob. And I, and I believe, personally, you know, that um, understanding God's character, knowing that he has a character of love, breeds love. It, it breeds that response. Once you know it, and it's a response to salvation, to what he's offered us. Love to him is, is, can be our response for in, in thankfulness, um, in respect, in awe, in honor, in all the things that we've talked about already. That, that you know, um, it's, our love to him is an act of thankfulness for all that he's given, for all that he's done. And... Um, I tell you what, it's deep, isn't it? It is very deep. <clears throat> Keep Jesus uplifted. We are laborers together with God. We are provided with spiritual weapons, mighty to the pulling down of the strongholds of the enemy. We must in no case misrepresent our faith by weaving unchristlike attributes into the work we must exalt the law of God as binding us up with Jesus Christ and all who love him and keep his commandments. We are also to reveal a love for the souls for whom Christ died, has died. Our faith is to be demonstrated as a power of which Christ is the author. Amen. We are to reflect the character of Jesus. Everywhere we should let the lovely image of Jesus appear. This we cannot do unless we are filled with his fullness. If we would become better acquainted with Jesus, we should love him for his goodness and excellence, and we should desire to become so assimilated to his divine character that all would know that we have been with Jesus and learned of him. 
not to keep the commandments of God is not to love him. None will keep the law of God unless they love him, who is the only begotten of the Father. And nonetheless, surely, if they love him, they will express that love by obedience to him. All who love Christ will be loved of the Father, and he will manifest himself to them. In all their <clears throat> emergencies and perplexities, they will have a helper in Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Thursday's lesson is the first commandment. <clears throat> and actually that was somewhat of Christ <clears throat> just repeating what was said in Deuteronomy. Mark 12, 28 to 30. <clears throat> And one of the scribes came and having heard them reason together and perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, what is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. <clears throat> Okay, what was the question asked about the first commandment of all? And how does Jesus respond, and from where did he get his answer? Well, he got it because he basically quoted what it said in Deuteronomy. Okay, at the bottom of the page it says, Someone were to ask you, how do people come to love a God that they have never seen personally, and what would you say? like the wind. You don't see the wind but you see the results. So Amen. we have to give testimony to the results of God in our life. Yeah. I've seen him. Huh? Yes. Have it you? Yeah. <clears throat> we, we, have, we, have, we have the record that shows us all about him. We, there's, there shouldn't be any question in our minds about who God is or what kind of person he is, or his personality, or whether or not he loves us. I mean, it's all, it's all recorded. We have the prophets. We have uh, the record that, that shows us. Well, and, and, like, and, if, and as we reflect on our own lives, with the Spirit opening our, <clears throat> our hearts, our we can see where he has been there. Amen. If we can't see that where he has been there, then we need to open the word. We need to pray because I believe he's been there and he will reveal that to us. Yeah. Some of us more dramatically than others. <laughs> I, you, well, I think all of us have all those experiences. We just got to look back. It yeah. says, you know, that that's we trust him because of where he's led us in the past. Yeah. Right. Right. I think there's many times he's intervened in everyone's lives here. We wouldn't be here if he didn't. Yeah. And so, therefore, we trust him for the future. Right. We, we, we know of his love because he's proved it. Right? Go ahead. <clears throat> Let us individually consider what is the record made in the books of heaven concerning our life and character and our attitude toward God. Has our love for God been increasing during the past year? If Christ is indeed abiding in our hearts, we shall love God. We shall love to obey all his commandments. And this love will continually deepen and strengthen. If we represent Christ to the world, we shall be pure in heart, in life, in character. We shall be holy in conversation. There will be no guile in our hearts or upon our lips. Let us examine our past life and see if we have given evidence of our love for Jesus by seeking to be like him and by working as he worked to save those for whom he died. Okay, then two more. It says the reason why we are not more joyful is that we have lost our first love. 
Let us then be zealous and repent. And the last one is God teaches that we should assemble in his house to cultivate the attributes of perfect love. This will fit the dwellers of earth for the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for all who love him. <clears throat> there they will assemble in the sanctuary from Sabbath to Sabbath, from one new moon to another, to night and loftiest strains of song, in praise and thanksgiving to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Now I want to finish by saying my own thoughts about you know, legalism and obedience and love. And what comes to my mind, and we are told why that this story of Mary uh, was in the Bible and how after Christ delivered her from her problems and how she came to the feast there at Simon's house and house and washed his feet and put that a year's worth of wages, perfume, did all of those things for him. And to me, that's a representation of what God wants from us. Now, he's gonna, not really going to get that devotion from every single person that's in the kingdom of God because not everybody loves the same. Not everybody has the maturity the same. But really, that's what he wants from all of us. He's not content for us to just go through a round of ceremony and some mindless service to him and just try to maintain a legal correctness with him. He Does he want that? Yes. But that's not really what he ultimately wants. Mary was absolutely in love with her Savior. She was devoted to him. He was everything to her. He had her highest thoughts. He had her most, um, I mean, he just was everything to her. And we are told, and it's interesting, that, that was even put in the scriptures. But it's an indication to show to us what Jesus is looking for from us. We are told how those acts of devotion to him not just merely going through the forms of religion, but going far above the call of duty to show Christ and, and heaven how much we appreciate what has been done for our salvation. And that's what he really wants from us. We have a handful of people in the Bible that really loved God that way. And that's really what he wants from all of us. And, and they loved and appreciated him so much, John, that they did what they did what he asked them to do. Yes. And that's why, you know, the mark of the beast in the end. Well, you know what it is. I mean, and, and, and our love for him will show to whether or not we do what he asks us to do. And there's a key to that. Not only do we do it, but it says, and it is not burdensome. Yes, exactly. That's right. And, and burdensome, not even a tiny bit. No. You know, it, burdensome means hard to do i have to do it i don't want to but i'm doing it anyway you know whatever level that's not there i mean which means i enjoy doing it right with mary she showed extravagant love yes very extravagant yes to the point that people were chastising her for yeah. the extravagance right yeah. yet that's the kind of love that christ gives us Yes, that is that is what he that's wants, what he, and we are saying. Gave us. Yeah, we are told that that sustained him, thinking about her devotion to him as one of the things that helped him be able to go through what he did there the last few hours of his life. Yeah. He, he remembered that, that's and right. and that is what he wants. It isn't just that he wants only what he's told us to do, but just like what I like you, it was extravagant love. He wants us to not see how little we can do and retain his favor. How much can we do, even above what he's asked us to do, to show him, sacrifice ourselves, our time, our money, to be with him and Amen. to try to advance his kingdom? And that's what he wants from all of us. Now, we aren't all going to reflect it to the exact same degree, and we are told that's, that's the truth. That's right. But that's really what he wants from us more than anything else, is to go far beyond what he's asked us to do Amen. and to just love him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, yeah. like what it says here. And we have to stop now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what Jesus has done. And we just ask, Father, that as we continue day by day to go through our lives, that we will learn to love you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. Please be with us now as we go into the second part of this service. And thank you again for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray.